So we're recording this computer. So now we're going to talk about the pelvic girdle and a little bit about the lumbar spine as well in kinesis. Just talking about some of the motions. We already covered the structure of the pelvis a little bit, right? We have our four bones, we have our coccyx, we have our sacrum, and we have our two os coccyx that makes up our whole pelvic kind of structure. Here's the difference between a pelvic arch for a man and a pelvic arch for a woman. And you can tell the difference, right? Because one releases babies, one does not release babies. That's why one has to be a little bit wider. There are four overall joints of the pelvis. We have our two sacroiliac joints. So joining the sacrum, right, with the iliac crest. We have our cubivivivus symphysis. And then we have our lumbosacral joint, which is where the lumbar vertebrae meet up with those, the sacral vertebrae. So those are the typical joints we talk about when we're talking about pelvic and pelvic problems with patients. The pelvis itself, yeah, release babies, release the babies. The pelvis itself is designed to support the weight of the body. It receives ground forces as well, obviously disperses those ground forces, protects our pelvic viscera, and it provides attachment for muscles. It also makes up the bony portion of the birth canal, not the soft tissue portion, which would be designed by soft tissue. So sometimes you'll hear people talk about the false pelvis versus the true pelvis. Is this really important so much for physical therapy? Not so much. Um, but if you ever hear somebody talking about the false pelvis, the false pelvis is the part of the pelvis that's not attached to the sacrum. So that would be your lumbar portion of the pelvis, right? And then also talking about the inferior aspect down here, right? The true pelvis is what is attached to that true sacrum, the part that meets up with the angles of the sacrum. So going from the pubis symphysis to sacral one, and then all the way down to the end of the coccyx. So the true and false pelvis, false pelvis is the greater or major pelvis. It's the bony area between the iliac crest superior to the pelvic inlet and it contains no pelvic organs in that region. This is why they usually say the true pelvis is the lesser or minor pelvis, but it has all the pelvic organs in it. Contains part of the GI tract, the urinary tract, some of the reproductive organs, and it also forms the birth canal in females. So just kind of looking at it again. So the sacroiliac joint, right? So where the sacrum meets the ileum, right? It is a synovial non-axial joint. What does that mean? Synovial non-axial. It has no what? No movement or shouldn't have any movement. Let's go there, right? It is a stability joint. So it shouldn't have a ton of movement. Um, depending upon some of the forms of PT you may see and you guys may encounter, you know, uh, somebody that does craniosacral therapy or something to that effect, They'll say that they can move the, sac the sacroiliac joint. And they can also move the fontanelles of the skull and the sutures of the skull. I'm not going to get into whether they can or they can't. If it helps the patient, great. Um, but I have yet somebody that can actually physically move the sacroiliac joint without breaking it. So the motion is talking about nutation versus counter nutation. So nutation is the sacral promontory moves anteriorly and inferiorly. And counternutation, the sacral promontory moves posterior and superiorly, right? This goes into when we do pelvic tilts, but it also involves motion of the spine with nutation versus counternutation. So typically when you're bending over, you're going into nutation. When you're leaning back, you're going into counternutation. So here's the sacrum, right? We have our base of the sacrum. And then down here, we have the attachment for the coccyx. We have our sacral promontory, superior articular processes, right, that allow for the lumbar processes to articulate on them. We have our ala, which is nothing more than saying wings. We have our foramen. What, what comes through the foramen, do you think? The nerves, right? Yeah, stuff. Then we have our auricular surfaces. What does auricular mean? Anyone know? Auricular looks like an ear. Yeah, exactly. Right. So we have the ears of the the sacrum. 
right? That's what's that's where those ilium are going to attach to. And then we have our pelvic surface, obviously. So here's kind of looking at our pelvic surface. There's our ears, our articular surface. There's our sacral promontory. And then there's our main body of the pelvis. And we get down here, we get to our little tailbone, our coccyx. The ilium, we have some tuberosities on it. We have its auricular surface, the iliac crest, the posterior superior iliac spine, the posterior inferior iliac spine, and the greater sciatic notch. The ischium, we have the body, the lesser sciatic notch, and the spinal spine and the tuberosities. So looking at this, here's our whole kind of outside of our pelvis. There's our iliac crest. We drop back our iliac crest. We come back, 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 back. We find our PSIS. And then we drop a little bit lower, we have our PIIS. Below our PIIS, we find our greater sciatic notch. Below the greater sciatic notch, we have our ischial spine. And then below the ischial spine, we have our lesser sciatic notch, going down into ischial body and down to the ramus. Then we have our ischial tube down here. And then that'll wrap around to our inferior pubic ramus, our pubic body, and our superior pubic ramus. And it'll come all the way around until we get to the front here where we have our ASIS. So sacroiliac ligaments. We have our anterior sacroiliac ligament, our interosseous sacroiliac ligament, our short posterior sacroiliac ligament, our long posterior sacroiliac ligament, our sacrotuberous ligament, our sacrospinous ligament, our iliolumbar ligament. So looking at those, this is kind of what it looks like at the pelvis. There are a whole rack of ligaments there, right? And that's main, mainly made sure, excuse me, that there's very little movement in that non-axial joint, right? It's to keep everything nice and firm so that weight bearing and load transfer happen. Some of these ligaments, we will, depending upon if you get into um, pelvic health or something like that, or um, urinary tract health, the sacrospinous and the sacrotuberous ligaments, you can mobilize. You are able to mobilize them, but not externally. There's only one way to mobilize those, and those are, that is internally. So I'll let you just take a gander, considering they're on the back side of the spine, how you're going to mobilize those internally. Does anyone need a direction manual? I think you got it. So then pubis symphysis here, right? We have our superior inferior pubic ligaments, and then we have our landmarks, which we already kind of covered. The superior pubic ligaments, the top part, inferior pubic ligaments, bottom part. And then we have our discs here between the pubis. And those are just mainly there for shock absorption in the middle, right? And then there's our inguinal ligament, right? And that helps form our femoral triangle, which we've talked about before. So anterior tilt, we've talked about some neutral is where the ASIS is kind of pointing straight forward. I like to think of the ASIS as headlights. Right, so let me get a little orange up or yellow here. So here's our headlights. When our headlights are pointed neutral, that's neutral tilt. When our headlights point down, that's anterior tilt. When our headlights point up, that's posterior tilt. And then obviously lateral tilt and rotation go along with it. But I often will, and there's and there are nice little um one of the clinics I had have these nice little laser pointers that you could put on the patient's ASIS and it would shoot a laser beam up into the roof so they could see and they could actually sweep that laser beam back and forth doing pelvic tilts. It really helped out a lot um, because teaching, uh, uh, this is dead honest, teaching the patient to do a pelvic tilt seems like it should be the easiest thing in the entire world. But for some reason, patients can't understand the difference between a pelvic tilt and a bridge. They just bridge for unknown reasons. Like, no, no, you don't have to pick your butt up. And then you turn around and they're over there flailing their butt up and down left and right. No, 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 you don't have to pick your butt up. So a lot of times you really have to get hands onto their pelvis and rock their pelvis for them so they can feel what it feels like to do those anterior and posterior pelvic tilts.
but I found that those little laser pointers you can put on really do help out. They, it gives them a visual cueing that they're supposed to sweep that laser back and forth, not point the laser further up. So joints here, right? Anytime that we have any type of pelvic tilt going on, the body is going to correct the whole way through the body, right? And this happens when we actually do walking, when we have a curvature of the spine, when we have a leg that's shorter or, or longer than the other. Anytime that we've got something going on there, we're gonna end up with a weird pelvic tilt going on. And so this just shows that anytime you make a pelvic tilt, the body is gonna self-correct in order to keep that center of gravity right where it needs to be so we have our balance, right? So if, if this center of gravity shifts over this way because of the pelvic tilt, the body's got to pull it that way so that it stays over the support beam. So rotation is going to be happening in the transverse plane and is going to talk about whether the ASIS is forward or back. So if the right ASIS is forward, it's right pelvic rotation. If the right ASIS is back, it's right posterior rotation. And then the same thing happens for the left. It's all going to be dependent upon which pelvis part is actually rotating and moving. So let's talk about pelvic tilt, right? And I talked briefly about this, but I want to go over this one more time just so that, because this is an important, important thing. If you can get this kind of concept for when you do your boards, it will really help out. So I'm going to make a diamond here. So this diamond is going to be your pelvis. So here's your ASIS. Back here's your PSIS. Right? So the reason I do that is because this helps because when you get a question about pelvic tilt and which muscles are short, which muscles are tight, this helps you kind of look at it a little bit better, right? So here we have our hip flexors. What's, what's going to be above the ASIS, what's going to attach up here is going to be our trunk flexors. Over here, we've got our spinal extensors. And back here, we have our hip extensors. That's an E. You could also say up here, if you don't want to call it spinal, you could say trunk extensors, if you wanted to keep it consistent. So when the ASIS moves down, what are we going into? What tilt? When the ASIS points down, we're in anterior tilt, okay? What's gonna happen to the hip flexors? Are they gonna get shorter or longer? Yeah, they're gonna get shorter. So if these get short, then the muscles that are exactly opposite them also get short. So your trunk extensors are going to shorten. They're going to contract, right? That means the other two muscles, right? These and these are going to do what? Yeah, they're going to become longer, right? So the reason I say this is because your board, your boards will say something like, your patient is in anterior pelvic tilt at rest. And I'll say, which of the following muscles would you stretch? So if it said, which of the muscles are you going to stretch, which ones are you going to stretch, just group-wise? You're going to stretch the short ones, right? Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. 
Are we doing okay? Are we awake? Bueller? Yes. So the question says, I'll write the question down here. So the question on your board says, patient is in anterior pelvic tilt. What muscles would you stretch? Right? So that's what the question says to you. So you would stretch out the hip flexors and the trunk extensors. Good. Right? And so that means what would you do to the other ones? If you're stretching those, you're going to do what to the other ones? Because they're now elongated, they're going to strengthen, you're going to strengthen them. Right? So the reason I say that is because if you can think of this diamond when you get questions like this, and I highly suggest if you get a question like this, draw the diamond and draw which way you're tilted and then think of the muscle groups because it will really, really help you. It is, right? It will really help you figure this out. So let me kind of clear this up a little bit and let's talk about the other. So it's clear, clear. I like the eraser. Oh, I didn't know I could hold it. Look at that. Learn something new every day. All right. So now, let's clear that one down there too. Eraser. There we go. So now, your patient is in posterior pelvic tilt at rest. I'm going to change it up. What muscles would you strengthen? Let's get the draw going on here, first of all. So first thing we're gonna do is draw posterior pelvic tilt, right? So the SIS is gonna go up, right? So what's, good, same, it's the same as the other question, just in reverse now, right? So now these are longer. And these are shorter. Does that make sense to everybody? So when this goes up, it's gonna pull these hip flexors all out, right? And you can actually feel that if you go into posterior pelvic tilt, you can actually feel your low back kind of stretching out. Try it once right now. So take, put your thumbs right on those ASISs and rock back into posterior pelvic tilt and see if you don't feel that back kind of stretch out a little bit, right? And you probably feel your hip extensors and your butt kind of tighten up, right? Because they're getting shorter. And especially if you're in a seated position, you're really going to have to rely on those glutes in order to get into pelvic tilt because your hamstrings are kind of weirded out at that point. Does that make sense for everybody? Okay, so let's, I'm going to change this up now. We're going to erase all of this. So I'm going to draw the diamond a different way now. So we talked about anterior and posterior tilt. Let's draw the diamond back again. Let's move it out. Let's get rid of it out of there. Let's move it out of here where it's whiter. Oh, eraser. I drew another diamond. All right. Draw diamond. Move out here where it's a little whiter. Okay, so now we've got right side. Left side. So now I got the right side versus the left side and here's kind of pelvic neutral coming straight across. Now you are in right inferior tilt. So you've got right lateral tilt inferiorly. So this part of the, the hip, this lateral side of my right hip is down, right? So if that side is down, what's happening to all my muscles on my right side? Yeah, they're getting short, right? What's happening to all my muscles on my left side? They're getting lengthened, 
right? So that means in order to pull that back up, we're gonna have to work over here. Does that make sense? Right, do a little bit of stretching over here to loosen up that right side. But the main thing we're gonna have to do is come over here and strengthen this left side to pull that pelvis back up where it should be and keep it level. Because what's happening probably is that left side's gotten weak, right? Because when we get that pelvic drop, what's that called? What sign is that? Trendelenburg. Good. Right? So now there can also be some issues with the spine too, but we're just talking pure pelvis now. So if I've got a right-sided pelvic drop, I'm going to probably stretch out a little bit of the right and more importantly, strengthen that left side to pull me back to neutral specifically really strengthening those hip abductors on that side. So your, your TFL and your glute mead. But that's how that diamond kind of will help you guys. If you can think about it when you're on your boards or on your tests, it helps you kind of differentiate what's happening at that pelvis. And that's kind of what this is showing here, right? So this is talking the patient's going into tilt. The muscles are going to work opposite each other. Right, so to go into anterior tilt, the hip flexors are gonna pull down, the truck extensors are gonna pull up. Posterior tilt, the truck flexors are gonna pull up and the hip extensors are gonna pull down. So they work in opposite of each other. So there's that kind of right pelvic tilt versus left pelvic tilt. And it'll depend upon how those muscles kind of work as to what's gonna keep it from happening. So freedom of movement. Well, the lumbar area is one of the most injured areas of the body. There's a moderate range of motion available, but the main reason we get that injury is because of lifting and twisting, right? We do a lot of bad lifting. Just as a general species, we just don't do lift right. And if you ever doubt that we don't lift right, just go to the gym, get on the treadmill or get on the bike, hold out a book, but don't actually read it and watch everyone in the gym lift. especially if somebody's doing something like a deadlift or a clean and jerk, watch their form and just sit there going, well, that's just job security for me, right? But it's true. We injure our backs a lot. Even the physical therapy, we do it. Yes, I just, it just blows my mind, right? And you want to correct them, but you know that if you go correct them, they're not going to listen to you anyway. It's kind of, it's, yeah, it's kind of like politics, isn't it, right? You want to correct the person, but you just know they're not going to listen to you anyway. And then maybe that one person that might listen to you, you know, they've got their headphones on too loud to listen to you anyway. It's like that, uh, the Liberty Mutual commercial, where he's talking to the guy about switching to Liberty Mutual and the guy takes off his headset. He's like, what? So thoracic, there's minimal movement due to the articulation of the ribs. And cervical, again, is the most freedom of movement. But when do we enter our cervical vertebrae most? During what? Yeah, car crash, right? What is the abbreviation for a car crash? MVA, good. What's the abbreviation for a motorcycle accident? Don't think too hard. Yes, MCA. You have to be careful though. Because, and this is a, tr this is tricky, just to warn you. So when you see MCA, if they're talking about, you know, vehicles, it's a motorcycle accident. Right? But if they go MCA and they're talking about the brain, it's not a motorcycle accident. Does anyone know what MCA in the brain stands for? Middle cerebral artery, right? So this gets, the only reason I say this is because this will get tricky in the hospital. Somebody will come up, somebody will come up to the stroke floor and they'll have, it'll say a patient has an MCA bleed and a new clinician will go, well, they got a motor, they got a bleed from a motorcycle accident. Well, no, what they're saying is they have middle cerebral artery bleed, right? But on the trauma floor, an MCA is a motorcycle accident, right? So it's kind of funny that they use the same terms. 
And I really wish they didn't, but unfortunately, medicine is like that. So common pathologies, we got torticola scoliosis, spinal stenosis, and herniated discs. Those are kind of common pathologies. Torticola, again, twisting. Scoliosis, so I wanna add, we have two, I have scoliosis here, but one other thing's missing from here is scoliosis slash kyphosis. So what is the difference between scoliosis and kyphosis? So if here's my spine, scoliosis is lateral, right? And kyphosis is anterior posterior. It's the hump, yep, kyphosis will cause a hump. That's fine, you got it, right? So scoliosis is a lateral curvature, whereas kyphosis is an anterior posterior curvature. What's the worst thing you could possibly have is a scoliotic and kyphotic curve. Because you think about that, now you've got a curve that's kind of twisting. Right, yeah. Think of the back pain then. It is possible, it's not very common, but it's possible. And that's, you know, if you, that's gonna be one of those where you see them, you're like, ooh, can I, I don't wanna use it, I wanna do a project on this because to me, that's the kind of stuff I really want to think about. Spinal stenosis, what can cause, so we saw a little bit of spinal stenosis in that one video. What does, what causes spinal stenosis? Or a narrowing of the spinal canal? What do you think one of the most common things that cause it is? Arthritis. And herniated discs, right? Herniated discs will cause it if it's kind of pushing on them. But if it's just pure bone, absolutely tumors can cause it too, right? But it's just pure bone growth. A lot of times it's just arthritic growth, right? Same thing if you see somebody that's got, you know, gnarled RA hands, they've got all those nodules all over their hands. It's just an arthritic, arthritic growth, right? It's that leading of degenerative joint disease in the spine. It will eventually lead to degenerative disc disease, which will eventually lead to narrowing the vertebra, vertebral canal, which leads to pain. And we talked about herniated discs. So remember with the herniated disc, let me get my little circles up here. So here we have our disc, right? Nice round disc. That wasn't a very good drawing. That's a really bad nucleus propulsus. You can't get this exactly right. Okay, so here's our nucleus propulsus. It's off center a little bit. Don't pick on me, right? So we have our annulus fibrosis, right? Which is our outsides of our disc. And then we have our nucleus fibrosis, which is that inside, right? Let me change color so you can actually see. The whole thing with the herniation, when you see something, when you're talking about herniation of the discs and you're talking about herniation of the spine, is what happens to that nucleus propulsus? Oh my God, would you cooperate? So if the nucleus propulsus stays inside, we're actually okay. For the most part, if that nucleus propulsus stays inside the spine, we could probably treat it with conventional therapy, right? Because the disc is intact. If we start getting something like this, where we get a little bit of bulging of it, that's where we start getting into problems. Because that means that this annulus fibrosis is now weakening. The worst thing that we can get is when the jelly escapes the donut. And that's what happened in that one video, the first video where she said there was no nucleus propulsus. It had actually escaped out and the body just reabsorbed it. And that disc was basically, if you look when he shredded, yeah, right, when he shredded it down, it just was, didn't it look just kind of like dry and like cake-like when he pull, was pulling it out. It was just chunky and it looked like he was pulling out sponge cake, exactly, right? But it was just dry and, you know, it's one of those where somebody gives you sponge cake and you're like, mm, yay, thank you, or it's the strawberries. But as long as that nucleus propulsus stays inside the disc, usually we can help it with conventional therapy, right? So let's think about something real quick. Let's say, so let's, let me put on some directional motions here. 
text. Let's go right. Let's go left. Let's go anterior. And let's go posterior. That doesn't even look right. Let me fix that. <laughs> Ignore me. Do not say anything. Be quiet. All right, Dara caught it. Good. Everyone else is too sleepy to pay attention. I'm happy with that. All right. So we got our anterior, we got our posterior, we got our right, and we got our left. Let's say this disc shifts to the right. Now it's going to be putting, so we got our nerve window over here where we got these nerves passing through, right? It's going to compress down on that. So the disc shifts to the right. The left side, because there's no disc there, is going to collapse. Does that make sense? So the left side is going to close off because there's no disc. So you can actually end up with two problems. You can end up with the right side having compression on the nerve window because the disc is pressing and the left side having compression because the spinal side is kind of compressing because the disc has shifted out of, so the disc is like this now, right? So what's neat is we can actually use osmotic properties to help pull that disc back into place, right? So if the disc looks like this right now, and what would happen if I would left side bend? What would that actually do to it? So now I'm putting more pressure on this left side. Yeah, it's gonna make it worse. It's gonna force it more this way. Does that make sense to everybody? So if I squeeze this side even harder, it's gonna force more of the jelly to go over to the right. Now let's think, what if instead I go right side bending and now I open up this left side? Now the jelly is gonna to wanna to go back to the left because there's space for it. And the right side is starting to get compressed and it's going, I don't like that very much. So it's going to try to squirt back to the left. And you can actually improve and move that disc back gradually by doing some of that kind of right side bending and opening up the left lateral aspect of the spine if the disc is shifted to the right. Does that make sense to everybody? Have I confused anyone? Now, which direction did I say it's unlikely for the disc to shift? Do you remember? Because of the, yes, why? What's up here keeping it from shifting anteriorly? What's nice and thick on the front side of the, the spine. Yeah, what ligament specifically? Do you remember what ligament? The ALL. There we go. The anterior longitudinal ligament. Anterior front side longitudinal running the whole length. Ligament. It's a really, really thick banded ligament. So most likely, that's why most of the discs, when they bulge, they bulge posteriorly. So if this is my front of my spine, the discs are going to bulge posteriorly. If they bulge posteriorly, the front side of my spine is going to collapse a little bit and close off because now there's no disc there to hold it open. So what way are you going to want the patient to go in order to suck that disc back the way it should be if it's posteriorly bulging? So you got the disc going this way. Okay, could do some tilt, right? Right, but let's think back actually at the spine itself. What can we do at the spine? Well, we're gonna to wanna to close off the posterior aspect of the spine. How do we close off the posterior aspect? Going into flexion or extension? Extension, right? Now, how many of you have heard me say, how long now 
extension, extension, extension. Same thing happens in the spine. That's why a lot of times you're gonna hear people talking about the McKenzie method. Has anyone ever heard that before? We often mistake McKenzie as being only extension-based training. But really what I just talked about with moving that disc around, that's the basis of McKenzie. It's directional bias. Meaning we're gonna move them in the direction that's going to help facilitate that disc to return to normal. So if it's posteriorly bulge, we're gonna go towards that bulge and try to force it the other way. If it's anteriorly bulge, which rarely happens, but it may, then we're gonna flex and we're gonna try to force it backwards. If it's to the right, we're gonna bend to the right and force it to the left. Yes, exactly, yep. So upward dog re push up or prone press up is what we call it in physical therapy, right? And then we could do downward dog if it's an anterior tilt or an anterior shift, right? Or just kind of trunk flexion forward. So that's kind of what happens when those discs shift. Now, if the jelly has escaped the donut, this is not gonna help it. At the point the jelly has escaped the donut, there's nothing, I mean, we can help relieve some of the pain by strengthening the muscles around it, but we can't fix the jelly donut. The jelly donut's dead, right? This is like grabbing a jelly donut and biting into it and there's literally nothing in it. It's kind of a disappointment. Right? or biting into a nice Boston cream donut and there's no Boston cream in it. That would be the idea of having that, that, nu that nucleus, the nucleus propulsus kind of shifting out. And as soon as that breaks, literally, as soon as it gets out here and starts popping through that anus fibrosis, it'll start drying out and dying. Because it's going to get exposed, some air in the body, and that's just going to dry it right out. As long as it stays contained here, as long as the egg yolk stays within the egg, everything will stay nice and moist and it'll still function. But as soon as it escapes, unfortunately, and at that point, really the only option is gonna be surgery. That doesn't mean we can't help, but it just means that we're not gonna be able to fix it. Is everyone kind of clear on that now? Are we okay? Sad is right. Sad jelly donuts. All right, let's get rid of my drawings. So I already showed that video there, kind of osteoporosis. We talked about the loss of bone structure, right? And you'll see this. If you ever see somebody that's osteoporotic, you ever actually get a chance to look at their, um, so if this is the body of their vertebrae. If you ever get to see a person that's got osteoporosis, what you'll get to see is all throughout it, they have these little holes, right? <laughs> and as they end up with those little holes, that's gonna compromise the structure or integrity of that, spine, that spinal body and it's gonna collapse. Uh, compression fracture is what's going to happen mainly because of that. So overall, that compression is just going to cause down. And we talked about spondylysis, spondylolisthesis already. Open and closed pack positions the lumbar spine. Open packed is midway between flexion and extension, and closed is in full extension. We're not going to be able to mobilize the spine in full extension. Capsular pattern is equal restrictions and lateral flexion followed by flexion and extension. So most of the time it's capsular of the spine, again, whether it's cervical, lumbar, or uh, thoracic, you're gonna lose more lateral flexion than you use flexion extension. Flexion extension is usually disc or and or joint. Lumbar motion, we can bend over about 60 degrees, we can extend about 25, and we can laterally flex about 25. The nice part about that is that makes it nice and even. Some of the newer books are making this even easier because they're saying that the lumbar flexion is 60, the extension is 30, and the flexion is 30. Um, that's one of the other range of motion measurements that they do. I tend to think that it's more 60, 25, 25, because 30 is just a lot of extension. Functional range of motion, sit to stand, you need about 35 degrees of functional motion. To put a socks on, you need sock on, socks on, socks, 
Socks on, socks off. Socks on, socks off. Right, Mr. Miyagi? To put socks on, you need about 56 degrees of lumbar flexion to reach down and put those socks on, right? Now, what happens if you don't have that lumbar flexion? What if I've had a spinal fusion and I'm wearing a Jewett brace, which is a brace that keeps me from bending over? How am I going to put socks on? gonna be real difficult, good. Well, they make this neat little device called a sock aid. And this would be the time that I would bring one of these out. They have those things on TV, exactly, right? And those things on TV have been in OT and PTA for OTA and PT for as long as they've been. It's just now they're advertising them on TV because people are like, oh, that makes sense, right? The sock aid is just this half of a tube that you slide the sock up on and you take and you put your foot, you put it down over your foot and you, it's got two strings and you just pull it. And as it pulls, it pulls the sock over the foot and pulls it right up the leg. Actually really easy. And this would be the time that a lot of, if I've usually when I've got a CNA that I would demonstrate these sock aids and I would show putting on tet hose, which are the compression hose. And the CNA looks at me and goes, why did I not know about these before? Because the sock aid, you can use to pull the whole way up the leg, and it'll pull the tet hose right up the leg. And if you've ever put, Kaylee's <laughs> Kaylee's Kaylee like what? <laughs> I figured I'd get someone. I usually get someone every class, right? It just helps it slide right up the leg. It makes it so much easier because the hardest part about the tet hose is getting it up over the foot because of how tight it is. Well, if you load it on the, the sock aid, you can pull it straight up, right? Here's a quick here's a quick question for you guys. Does everyone know what tet hose is and compression hose? Right, compression hose are tet hose are stockings that keep patients compressed so they don't get DVTs a lot of times because they're not moving. Well, tet hose have a little hole in the bottom of the foot that goes over the ball of the foot. Why does it have a hole in the sock? That just seems weird. And Kaylee can attest to that the hole being there. Yes, Kaylee? All right, why is that hole there? Does anyone have any idea? Because it's going to be right at the ball of the foot usually is where it sits. What's that gonna allow you to do? Check blood flow. Right, because you can get in and palpate temperature and you can also look at the blood flow of the toes to make sure those tet hose aren't too tight. Because although, yeah, it's to prevent cyanosis, right? It helps you look to see if they've got cyanosis going on in the toes. That's the point of those. And a lot of people don't know, they're like, I don't know why that stupid hole is there. And it annoys patients. I'm going to tell you, it annoys them. Because every time they plant down, they kind of have that hole right there where they're planting down and it just doesn't feel right. But just explain to them the reason they have that is so that we make sure that the TED hose aren't cutting off circulation. And like, oh, okay. And most of the time they're gonna have the, the grippy socks over it anyway, right? If I can teach you guys nothing again else, if you get a patient up, they better either have shoes on or grippy socks on? Because that's gonna be one of the first questions if your patient has a fall. First question is gonna be, do you have a gait belt on them? Second question is, did they have non-slip footwear on? Tet hose are not non-slip footwear. Tet hose are pretty much slip footwear. They will cause your patient to fall. They are about as slick as like grease. So make sure you put patient socks on, their, the grippy socks on their feet if you can. Um, what's the universal color of a fall risk in a hospital? What color do they put on a patient that's a fall risk? Does anyone know? Has anyone seen anyone with the bit? Yes, yellow. Yellow is a sign that a patient is a fall risk. So if you see them with the yellow band around their wrist, or if they've got yellow grippy socks on, or a lot of hospitals are going to the bright yellow gowns now. That means that patient is a fall risk. 
And they're going to put those on patients because that just warns all the staff that says, hey, this dude or dudette is likely to fall. Pay attention. So motion of the spine, we get lumbar flexion extension, right? We're going to test range of motion. We're going to do that in lab. And manual muscle testing, we already talked about extension, right? Flexion and rotation. That was pretty much perfect timing. I couldn't have timed that better if I tried. Actually, I did try. That's why, where did my video go? There it is. I wasn't trying to minimize the video. Stop telling me that. <laughs> 